Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Covenants are important in the scripture, each and every one of them. And one that we tend to forget about is the marriage covenant. It is clearly taught in the word of God that when you enter into a marital relationship, you are entering into a covenant, a covenant between a man and a woman and God. And we see that the marriage covenant is important for a variety of ways. One is that God uses the marriage covenant symbolically to speak about his relationship with Israel, that Israel is the wife of God. Likewise, we see in the new covenant that Messiah Yeshua, and I'm speaking about Jesus Christ, the scripture says that he is the groom and the believers, his disciples, the congregation of redeemed, the church is the bride. So over in the scripture, we see both in the old and the new marriage being affirmed in a significant way. And therefore, if we are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, if we want to be obedient to the things of God, if we get married, this marriage, we need to recognize it as a covenant and we need to understand that our marital relationship reveals truth concerning our faith, our faith in God and our commitment to him. In other words, marriage is a testimony, and we should be greatly concerned with the testimony that we have that our marriage is in the life of other people. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 19, the book of Matthew and chapter 19. Now, in this portion of Scripture, notice how it begins. We read in verse 1. And it came about when Yeshua finished these words. Now, that means we have to remember what he was speaking about. And we can summarize all of these words with one word, and that is kingdom. He was speaking about the kingdom of God. And it's only when you are concerned about the kingdom of God that you are passionate, that you are committed to the king, kingdom of God, and you are going to be in the kingdom of God because of your faith, then and only then are you going to strive, submit, rely upon the Holy Spirit in order that you might have a marriage that is indeed a godly testimony, one that God is well pleased with, one that, that manifests the, the love of God, the commitment of God, the faithfulness of God, as you demonstrate that to your partner. If you're a husband, how you demonstrate it to your wife. If you're a wife, how you demonstrate that love, that commitment to your husband. And we do that simply because God commands it. We are more concerned with being a godly testimony, our marriage, than whether we're joyful, whether it's always pleasing to us, whether we're having a good time or not. Because when we are faithful to the commandments concerning our marriage obligations, when we are faithful to them, God will go to work. Sometimes he works on our spouse and other times he changes us in order that the two, as we're going to see, becomes one. And one, that word, oftentimes in the scripture, 
very frequently, one relates to God, that we manifest God in our life, God in our marriage. So we're only going to be committed to that if indeed we are kingdom-minded. Look again at verse 1. And it came about when Yeshua had finished these words that he withdrew or departed from the Galilee and he came into the regions, and it's in the plural in the original language. He came into the regions of Judea on the other side of the Jordan River. That's the implication. The other side of the Jordan. Now, this area is exactly where Sodom and Gomorrah was. This place is where God poured out in a unique, in a powerful way, his displeasure for individuals that did not abide in his word, that misappropriated the, the gifts that special union and relationship between a man and a woman in a marital covenant. These people, the Sodomites and the people from Gomorrah, they were in sin, a sin that God calls an abomination, what God hates, and therefore judgment fell upon them. This is why the scripture tells us that Yeshua went specifically to that location to have this discussion, what we're going to study in this passage of Scripture. So he went into the regions of Judea in that southern kingdom on the other side of the Jordan. And look now to verse 2. We are told here, and many crowds, not just one crowd, but many multitudes of people. Many crowds follow after him. And what did he do? It says here, he healed them there. Now, why is that so important, that last word in the biblical text? He healed them there. In the place where judgment fell, he also healed. And we see something. Judgment can have a healing effect in a person's life. What do I mean by that? When you remember God is a God of judgment, that he punishes sin and disobedience, when you really believe in a God who will judge, that fact, that reality is going to bring a change in your life. You are going to be more sensitive to pleasing him, obeying him, submitting to him, doing what he commands us to do. And this is foundational in a marriage. If I'm not sensitive to the words of God, the instructions of God, I am not going to be faithful to my partner, my spouse, my wife. And because of that, because of that disobedience, if I do disobey, I'm not kind, I'm not faithful, I'm not obedient to his instructions, then I am heading towards judgment. And this location reminds us that God does judge sin, and he judges it severely. So they come to this location, and he healed them there. The Pharisees coming to him, and why did they come to him? The Bible says they came in order to test him. And this word here is not for the purpose of learning something. It's not like a test that a teacher would give one of his or her students. But this is a, a tempting for the purpose of causing one to fall, to stumble, to behave in an inappropriate way. Now, they were testing him because they had a very, very different mindset. See, they were man-pleasers, not Messiah. Yeshua wanted to live, behave in a way that honored his father, and he did so perfectly. 
And he did so as an example to us. The Son of God brought honor to his Father. And that's what all humanity is supposed to do. We are supposed to honor God by obeying his word. Messiah is the perfect example of this. So in this passage of scripture, we find very clearly that these Pharisees, they came to him in this location in order to test them, literally for the purpose of falling. And they were saying to him, is it lawful for a man to send forth? That means divorce. It's an idiom. Is it lawful? For a man to send forth his wife, that is, divorce her, for every reason or anything. Now, that would be very popular. See, many men would like that. I can simply end that relationship for any reason I want. But the Word of God does not say that. But here's the problem. According to the traditions of the elder, not the word of God, not the law of God, not the commandments of God, but according to the traditions of the sages, the elders, this was their view. And it was exceedingly popular among society, among male side society members. They liked that. And they used that in order to put pressure upon their wives. Why? Well, when a woman, if she was just sent forth, it put her in a very vulnerable position. And therefore, that threat was used to manipulate the woman, his wife. Now, that's not love. That's not kindness. That's not the character of Messiah. That's not someone who believes that God is a God of judgment because God would judge, judge such a one that behaves in, in this manner and this unkind way too of all people, a man that would do that to his wife. How horrible. But it was popular. And I need to say to you this, many of the things that are popular today even within the local congregation, in many denominations. They're popular, but they are offensive to God. God hates many of these things when we compromise the integrity of his word. So when we look at this passage of scripture, they ask the question, trying to get him to either agree with them, and that would give them uh, support, or disagree with them, and that would make him very unpopular. Learn something. The Son of God, Yeshua Menetzrat, he never was concerned with being popular. And no true servant of God is ever concerned with pleasing others. No, his objective, her objective, is to honor God obey him, live in a way that he finds well-pleasing. So notice what Yeshua says in response, verse 4. But, that means in contrast to their desire, but the one. Now, this is referring to Yeshua. Most English Bibles don't have that in, but it's the definite article referring to him. So the one, meaning he answered. He said to them, have you not read, meaning in the Torah? More often than not, when he says, have you not read, he's referring to the law of Moses. And certainly what he's going to say in a few moments confirms that. So he simply asked the question, have you not read that? And it's the same word, the one. Now, what the scripture is doing here, by the use of that Greek definite article referring first to Yeshua, and then secondly, to God the Father, what does it do? It shows unity, that they were one, one in purpose, one in thought. There was no difference between them. What Messiah taught, he taught the will, the purpose, the truth of his heavenly Father. 
So he says, have you not read that, that he made from the beginning, male and female, he made them. That's exactly what it says in the book of Genesis. When God created Adam, Adam, the first man, it says that he made Adam male and female. And the purpose was to show exactly what we're coming to, and that is this unity that happens between a man and a woman and never the community, the culture that we're living in today is so confused, so rebellious. It is a affront. It is an abomination that that countries like America, that they uphold same-sex marriage. This is sinful. It is wrong and it will bring about the judgment of God on such people and upon the society that affirms that. And first is going to be on the leaders that legislate this or on the Supreme Court that says so incorrectly, so despicably that it is constitution, it's part of the constitution that a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman. It is, again, an abomination. It is the deceit from the pit of hell. And when people won't stand up and say that, it is because they want to be man-pleasers instead of wanting to honor God. Never, never, never worry about the consequences. Always be concerned with being faithful to God and leave the consequences to Him. I learned that, for example, from someone who has been a great blessing in my life, never met him, but I'm speaking about Charles Stanley, who has frequently said that, trust God, meaning obey, rely upon God, and leave the consequences to him. What a wonderful principle, and how true it is according to the word of God. So Messiah says what the Bible does. He always quotes scripture. He says, on account of this, he's made them male and female. He made them. And he said, on account of this, a man will leave the father and the mother and cling to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. Here again, all of this is seen and taught in the book of Genesis. And that word for cling, if you look about it in the original language where it comes from in the book of Genesis, it is the same word for one, a servant of God, clinging to the commandments of God. So we are going to honor, and the teaching is this, we will honor the commandments of God to the same degree that we honor the marital covenant. When we are not committed to the word of God, we will not be committed to obeying the marriage covenant. And today, unfortunately, we see that in many places that, that the respect for the covenant of marriage is, is less than it's being compromised to agree with a worldly perspective rather than the perspective of God. Look again, verse, verse 6. He says, so that no longer... No longer are they two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God, and this shows how God is part of the marital covenant. What God has united, joined together, he says, let no man separate. Let no man dissolve. Verse, verse 7. They said to him, why therefore... Did Moses command to give, and pay attention to these next two words. The next word speaks about a document of significance. And what is the Greek word? Well, it's where we get the English word Bible from. So this document, this writ, is a Bible, but it's not the Bible scripture. It's speaking about a document of great importance. And the second word 
You ought to do a study of this word because it's the same word, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where it speaks about, verse 3, the apostasy. And also, Acts chapter 21 and verse 21. Moses there, excuse me, Paul, is being accused of departing from the law of Moses. Now, some Bible speaks of this departure as heresy. So apostasy is when we depart from that which is good. Apostasy that Paul speaks of, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it's turning away from truth that is going to give rise to the revealing of the Antichrist. And why does this word appear, not just here, but also we find it the first time in the New Testament in the book of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31 where it's used in the same way, speaking about a certificate, a document of divorce. And why is it used there? Because both here in our verse and in Matthew 5 verse 31, it speaks about something. How divorce is a departure, a departure from that which is good to that which is not good. Now, listen carefully to what Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, your Lord and Savior, God among us, what he said about this such important subject. So we read, they asked these Pharisees, therefore, why did Moses command to be given, meaning this woman, a, a certificate of divorce, literally a document of apostasy, and to send her away. Verse 8, he says to them, because Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, he permitted to send the wife, your wives or women, away. But from the beginning, it was not so. And this word for it was not so, that, that main verb, gagonin, what is that? It speaks about something that was true in the past, true in the present, and it goes on into the future. This speaks about God's will from the beginning, what he wants and what should be affirmed by us. But man, the hardness of our hearts won't allow us to agree with God. We need to repent. We need to become a new creation. We need the mind of Christ to be able to, to do such a thing. Verse 9. But I say to you that whoever sends forth, that is divorces, his wife, and listen to this, except for sexual immorality, that's the only reason, except for sexual immorality, and, and marries another, this one commits adultery. And the one who marries the one who is sent away, this one also commits adultery. So very strong words about, about this instruction concerning marriage and divorce. Only, only for sexual immorality. And when one is divorced for sexual immorality, if one marries her or him, this one who marries that one who's divorced is, is also committing adultery by doing so. This is what the Word of God says. Verse, verse 10. His disciples said to him, if thus this cause is for man with woman, if thus is the, the cause, the case, excuse me, if thus is the case with a man and a woman, is it not better not to marry? And notice his response, verse 11. He said to them, not everyone, not all people can receive this word, but only to the ones it's been given. Now, what this scripture reveals is this. There are certain individuals that have been called uniquely not to marry. Marrying is a commandment. It is a good thing, but there are those. The scripture affirms this. So Paul says it elsewhere as where. So both Yeshua says it and Paul. There are individuals that God has a call upon them, a unique call, not to marry. Why is that? Well, notice what he says. Verse, verse 11. 
And he said to them, not all is able to receive this word, but to those who has been given, it says, for they, they are, there are eunuchs, some from their mother's womb, they have been born such, and there are others that have been made eunuchs by, by others, by other men. Now, this speaks about how at certain times people, they were, were born to be a eunuch. We'll talk about that in a second. Others were made a eunuch by someone else, usually to serve in a prestigious place in a government. So they would be totally committed to a king or a very powerful man and, and would never be involved with a woman. That was the case. He's using examples from society. He also says there are those other ones who make themselves eunuchs, won't get married. But why did they do it? Well, this is what he speaks of when he talked about earlier about those who it has been given to. And that is those who are eunuchs, meaning they never get married. Why? Notice what it says. On account of the kingdom of heaven. So eunuchs. Some would, for financial well-being, make themselves a eunuch. Others were forced to be a eunuch. But there's still others who, not for financial well-being, not for some prestigious position, but because, what does the scripture say? But because of, on account of, the kingdom of God. That's why they don't get married. So they could be totally dedicated in every aspect to the things of God. And notice how this section ends, a statement of the kingdom of God. It seems like, does it not almost always when Messiah is teaching at the very forefront of what he's speaking of is the kingdom of God. And then our passage, and we'll conclude with this in this lesson, it says, uh, not everyone is able to receive this but the one who is let him receive it let her receive it so messiah speaks here about how important marriage is but he ends with that special call of singlehood in order to serve in a unique way in a totally committed fashion the kingdom of god well marriage that covenant it cannot be overemphasized how important it is. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.